So welcome everyone to our Greening Finances focused on banking and credit cards event um, through uh, Cool Davis and the city of Davis. Um, we are so happy that you're here joining us. And this of course shows your amazing commitment to um, making a better world. So this is uh, this uh, action originated from the Yellow Earth Day Pledge here in Yolo County, California. Um, but it is open to anyone and everyone who is uh, willing and interested to take on the, the journey of greening your finances. And we're really, you know, it's, it's a matter of digging in much deeper. Uh, we will have a follow on event that we're hoping um, some folks here will also participate in that focuses more on investments. Today is banking and credit cards. Um, and this is an opportunity to connect with others and, um, the video and, and have fun, uh, yet be intentional. Um, we will be videotaping this and putting it up on YouTube um, and we'll be sharing it back with participants as well. So my name is Leslie Krenna. I'm a campaign manager for household engagement with Cool Davis. We have uh, several of our Sacramento Valley College Corps fellows with us today also and uh, Brittany Nile, um, communication intern. Um, uh, Cecilia Mali will be reading our land acknowledgement today. Our new campaign coordinator, coordinator Brandon Ru Rueda, is uh, our tech support today. Thank you, Brandon. And um, I don't see any um, pledge, uh, pledge uh, um, campaign advisors today. So um, I will move on to uh, introducing our moderator, Reka Vaitla, uh, who is a uh, resident here in Davis and uh, works um, with um, sustainable finance with CalSTRS, and you will learn more about her um, as we go forward. So take it away, Reka. Hey, thanks. Um, so my name is Reka. I am an investment officer with CalSTRS. Um, I work on the Sustainable Investment Stewardship Strategies team, um, but in the past, I've actually worked with um, the Illinois State Treasurer on um, sustainability and finance and also um, in banking. And so I'm really excited that we're doing this panel today um, and that we can have a, have a really great discussion, I'm hoping, um, on, on greening your finances and banking. Um, but with that, I will actually turn it over to um, Cecilia to do a land acknowledgement. Hello, so as we begin today, we would like to acknowledge the land on which we are gathered. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of the Putwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Putwin tribes, the Kacho Dihi Band of Wintun Indians of the Kalusa Indian Community, the Klutsel Dihi Wintun Nation, and the Yocha Dihi Wintun Nation. The Putwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished, protected, as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. Cecilia. And so um, as a sort of introduction to today's event, the agenda, you know, we'll start with Kathy's presentation, then we'll move into um, a discussion of so that I can ask her some questions and then also you can ask her some questions with the Q&A. Um, so feel free to submit the questions into the Q&A feature. Um, and perhaps we might, if we have extra time and there aren't as many questions in the Q&A, people can raise hands. And that would be really great too, to hear what, what everybody's thinking, what everybody's curious about. Um, so I, before I jump into, the, before we jump into the presentation and have Kathy introduce herself, um, I will, will go over the Cool Davis norms, um, our culture norms. And so, um, just to level set with everyone here, you know, we want to make sure that the conversation and discussion that we have is solutions oriented and we keep a mindset that focuses on finding and implementing solutions and looking past, um, current problems or actions um, of the past, uh, current problems or actions of the past to kind of noodle on potential outcomes for the future. 
Um, we also strive to make this a space that is non-judgmental. Um, we all have different lifestyles, needs, activities that we participate in, and some of us may be further along in um, taking actions that help achieve climate resilience, and that's okay. We're all here to learn, and in order to do that most effectively, we need to start from a place of openness. Um, and the next piece is to make space, you know, allow yourself to listen to what others have to say um, and make the space to allow everyone to participate in the conversation um, and take space, you know, just as we want everyone to have a chance to say something, you should say something um, and take space, even if you know, even if you think you don't have as much to say, I'm not an expert. I think there's no stupid questions. There's, um, there aren't any comments that are, um, that are not appropriate. Uh, well, unless they kind of don't fit into <laughs> the cultural norms um, here, but, um, but this is a space that's evolving constantly. I don't even know that there is such thing as an expert in this. Um, and so, I've found that you're also frequently not alone in having questions or doubts. Um, and so please share because I think it'll be beneficial to everyone um, if you take space and make space for everyone else. Um, so this is also a safe place. Um, as I mentioned, it's an area of non-judgment and it's a safe place to ask questions, um, have a discourse and ensure and so I encourage everyone um, to ensure that it's a safe place by um by ensuring that you follow the culture and norms stated here. Um, we try to do that by setting these. And um, we also demand that everyone participating create a safe sp place for others. Um, but with that, I will actually turn it over to Kathy to introduce herself. She is she's with Green America. And um, Kathy, I, I turn it to you to, to introduce yourself and start the presentation. Great. Well, thank you all so much for having me. I just want to make sure, can you all hear me okay? Um, and I will say full disclosure, sometimes my internet acts up and I, I can glitch a little bit. Um, supposedly this is fiber optic internet, but sometimes it glitches. So if that happens, we'll just roll with it and keep powering through. Um, yeah, so my name's Kathy Becker. I'm the Responsible Finance Campaign Director at Green America. Um, I've only been there since February, so I would not consider myself an expert on this. I have learned a lot since February and I'm still learning about this, but if there's questions people have that I can't answer, I will just say so and I will find the answer and, and get back to you. But I will share with you today what I've learned about this. Um, just for general knowledge, my background, um, is not in finances as a climate activist. So I am based out of Columbus, Ohio, and I led a campaign that um, got Columbus to commit to 100% renewable energy and enact the largest 100% renewable energy aggregation, electricity aggregation program in the Midwest. It's second only to, or third only to two in California. CCA is a big thing in California. And it's getting to be a big thing here because now a lot of the suburbs around central Ohio are doing it and other cities in Ohio are doing it. And this is a fossil fuel state. So that's really big progress for them. Um, and then after that, I ran a local sustainability nonprofit for about a year and a half that did sustainability education and you know focused on solutions. And that's what Green America focuses on as well. There are definitely problems in the world and we look for solutions. Um, so we'll talk about a couple of those today, and I guess I will go ahead and try to share my screen, and let's, um, okay, is that visible to you all, the presentation? It's visible to me. Okay, great. All right, so this presentation is about aligning your money with your values, and specifically banks and credit cards. So we're going to talk briefly about the problem, so you understand why do we want to do this? Because honestly, switching switching your bank, switching your credit card can be a bit of a hassle. So you want to know why you're doing this and, and what the solution is. And then also I'll let you know at the end kind of where this is going in future directions. Um, but the heart of the climate, I mean, just the heart of the entire climate crisis is a spiritual, ethical, and moral issue. Um, it's basically our the way our society is structured places money and profit above all other considerations, you know, our health, our environment, 
um, the other species we share this planet with, our democracy and society, and our children's future um, is all being placed in jeopardy by the continuation of billions of dollars going to the fossil fuel industry. It's still the most profitable industry in human history. And the key to changing that is changing the flow of money. And so this is what that's about. So there's a report that you may know of called the Banking on Climate Chaos Report. They recently, and, and it's done by a series of environmental nonprofits. Rainforest Action Network is kind of the lead, but also um, Sierra Club, Oil Change International, um, and several others are involved. And they look specifically at how much, you know, they track 60 big banks and how much they are investing in fossil fuels. And so these are the top, the top four in the world are all US banks, JP Morgan Chase, Citi, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America. They're all investing hundreds of billions. This is since the Paris Climate Agreement. So, you know, all the nations of the world came together in 2015 in Paris and said, we're gonna hold global warming to as close to 1.5 C as possible. And we're fast approaching that. Um, and these banks just continue to shovel billions into fossil fuels. Um, all 60 of them together is 5.5 trillion since then. These top four is about 25% of that total. Um, so if you're in one of the big banks, like, well, let me get to the next um, slide on that. So um, this is, you know, something I, I learned since coming to Green America. Um, and this is according to the FDIC, how banking and money works. So if you put your money into like a bank account, um, it doesn't just sit there. The, it helps the bank lend money out to somebody else. So they use that money to lend to other customers, whether it's individuals like for a mortgage or a car loan or businesses, you know, or construction or something like that. And then those people getting the loans pay interest back to the bank for borrowing the money. And the bank pays you interest in your savings account for keeping your money and using your money and you know the interest that they're paid is more than they're paying you for your savings. So that's one way that banks, um, that's one way they make money. Uh, so what that means is if you're banking with one of those big four banks, that's that their other customers are disproportionately fossil fuels, that money you have in savings is helping to fund those fossil fuels. So third act, and I can show this later when the presentation's over, um, Third Act has a little calculator on its website for the top six banks that are in those 60. And you can put in that calculator how much, like, say I have this amount of money in savings. How, and let's say it's in Wells Fargo or JP Morgan Chase. Um, how much carbon is that emitting? And if it's around $62,000, then that's about eight tons of carbon being emitted through the lending that they're doing disproportionately to fossil fuels. And that's you know as much carbon emissions as the average American makes in six months. Um, so that means your bank account could represent a big part or maybe the biggest part of your carbon footprint, and you don't even know it. And and the thing with banks is you know so let's say if you know a, a coal baron came to you and said, "Will you lend me some money because I want to go blow this top off this mountain and get to the coal underneath." you would probably say, no, I'm not going to lend you that. I don't believe in that. I think that's a really bad thing you're doing and I'm not going to lend you money for that. But if they go to Chase Bank, Chase Bank is going to say, yeah, here you go. And, and that's you know enabled by your money in there. So you don't have any say-so over that. It's not like investing where you can say, I want to invest in this fund, A fund, B fund, and C fund, and exactly how much. It's just you put it in there and the bank uses it. And you know, the reason we use banks, one reason is um, security because they're backed by um, the FDIC deposits up to $250,000. And the same with credit unions, they're backed by an organization called NCUA. And then also convenience, you know, you have branches that you can go to and you can make deposits and you can do electronic deposits. And so, you know, it's a lot better than keeping your money under a mattress, but then you don't have a lot of control over what happens to that money. So the way you do have control over what happens to that money is you choose your bank. So you choose a bank that uses the money for good, or at least doesn't use it for evil. And at least, uh, but even better would be a bank that uses it for good. So you get a better bank. 
So there's kind of a spectrum, like we, we kind of see it as a spectrum of banks. So on the one end, there's the Wall Street banks, those, those big four banks. And it's, it's not like they don't have any purpose. So there are big companies, you know, like Walmart or Target or any company that's doing international business and they have complex, large operations and they have regulatory requirements they have to meet. And so these big Wall Street banks specialize in that. They help these big companies do that. They also disproportionately invest in fossil fuels, but they do have a reasonable purpose. But most of us regular people, we don't need that in a bank. And also the big Wall Street banks do not invest in the local community. And then kind of in the middle are the regional banks, like a large regional bank. Um, they typically serve like several states or a region of the country. And they have a lot of locations. They have convenience. They also don't do as much local investing. Um, some of them may have some fossil fuel investments that are regional. So like, for example, there's a bank called Key Bank that's based in Ohio, um, but it has branches in a bunch of different states. They helped fund a fracked gas pipeline in Buffalo. So, you know, they were somewhat into fossil fuels, but not like, you know, the big four, the big six with billions and billions of dollars. Um, so if you go to a regional bank, you know, you're doing a lot less with carbon emissions. Um, but if you really want to invest in your community and do good, um, then there's community banks and community credit unions. So their whole function is to invest in the local community. So they do like small business loans, mortgages, auto loans. Um, they are too small generally to invest in fossil fuels, even if they wanted to. But they would be fine for just a normal person's normal banking. And many of them specifically invest and serve low income areas and minority populations. Um, so the, that's where, you, you know, if you want your money to help do like invest in your own community and, and do good, or even if you want online banking in somebody else's community, um, then that's wh what to go with is the community banks and credit unions. Um, so how do you find those? So there's two, there's several resources out there. Like there's one called Bank Green um, and one called Bank for Good. Uh, but I'm gonna focus on two of them. And we may, I think we may open these up after the presentation. We can open these up and play with them and look at some different banks and, and credit unions. Um, Green America has a bank map and um, we have specific criteria. So our bank map is, or our banking tool is basically anyone here is a good guy. These are all like, you have to meet specific criteria to get onto our bank map. Um, so you have to be certified by community development financial institutions. Their mission is to serve low income communities. Um, certified by our Green Business Network. Um, be a member of Inclusive, which is community development. It's like community development banks, only for credit unions. Um, there's an organization called Global Alliance for Banking on Values or a FDIC Minority Depository Institution, which means it either is owned by and or serves minority customers primarily. Um, we're going to be updating our bank map. It's full disclosure, not all that user friendly. The data is good. The data is there. Um, but I want to make it more user friendly and, and also add some criteria like B Corps banks and, and community banks um, that may not be on there. So another tool that's very popular is called Mighty Deposits. So they have like 10,000 banks and credit unions and they use public like data from what banks and credit unions have to report to the government about what they invest in. Um, they list banks and credit unions separately on two separate searches. You put your location in and then it pops up a list and it tells you like out of say every hundred dollars that is in your bank account, how much is, are they investing in that community? Um, and so they have a bunch and they list a bunch of things like women owned and black owned and, um, you know, different things like that or different features the bank has. They also have a button if it's a top funder of fossil fuels. Um, and those are just the top funders. Um, ones that don't have that button, there may be some that also fund fossil fuels on a lower level, um, but they have a bunch of what we call, and I can show you when we get there, some good guy buttons and bad guy buttons. Um, but those are two good tools to find a better bank or credit union. 
So um, Green America has long had a breakup with your mega bank campaign. Um, and we have a document, we even have a poster of this about 10 steps for breaking up with your mega bank. Um, so those are the, those are the 10 steps. Um, and let's see. So it is a process. So, you know, it's not like an action alert where you like fill in your information and you click send and it sends something to your representative and you're done. It, it is more involved. Um, but it's, you know, be, being that this is such a large source of unseen carbon emissions, it's something we really encourage people to do. And I'll talk at the end about future directions, but we actually are building a curriculum and hoping to have cohorts so that people can help research in their areas so they can kind of help each other through this. Cause it, you know, it is, it, it's, it's not a, I mean, it's not a ginormous undertaking, but it does take some work. So, you know, the first thing is to find your community development bank or credit union. You want to look at, you know, not just the values, but also what services they offer. Like, do they have what you need? So I found one at one point that I was going to use for an LLC that I was starting with a friend and they wouldn't service any LLC that wasn't a single owner LLC. They wouldn't service any that had two owners. So we couldn't go there and they were a great bank otherwise. So they have to have the services you need and then also the values that you want. Um, and then you go ahead and open up an account there once you have it, but you keep both accounts open and then you make lists. So you make sure you catalog your automatic deposits, the money going in. This is things like your paycheck or social security. Um, and, and that may require you know, looking at um, your routing number, which is at the bottom of checks, your routing number and account number. You'll probably need that for some of this. Um, for moving your automatic deposits to your new account, you'll have to file with that. You'll want to know the date that that actually got moved. You know, just do those one at a time. So, you know, just a little bit of time, like an hour a week or something for a bit. You know, this is going to take a couple of months probably to do all this. And then you want to, then you tap out your withdrawals. So then you move, you know, once you got your deposits flowing into your new account, you move your withdrawals to your new account. And you want to leave enough in your old account to cover any surprise withdrawals or, you know, anything that might be out there that you hadn't quite tracked yet. But move the withdrawals to the new account. And then you want to make sure you have all the, um, you know, statements and things like that. So if it's online only account, you might have to screen shoot these things. Usually you can download them from your account. You might have the hard copies, but have those going back like maybe three years um, for your, your monthly statements. Um, and then when you're ready, transfer the final funds over. That can usually be done just electronically and close the mega bank account and tell the mega bank why you're closing their account that their funding of fossil fuels does not align with your values, you know, and then, in, you know, let people know because there's not a lot of financial education and literacy about this. So like your workplace or if you're on a nonprofit board or in a congregation or house of worship or have an alma mater or, you know, anywhere where you have some influence um, or just letting people know what you did. So that's kind of the banking and then, um, I'm not sure whether to go on into credit cards or take questions. What do you all think? Um, I think, why don't you go into credit cards? And if folks have questions, please put them into the Q&A. And if we, or you can save them for later. Maybe something you have a question is like related to another part and you want to wait. Um, but why don't you put it in there? And if there's questions that come in, then um, we might, we can we can put them at the end. Okay, sounds good. All right, so going into credit cards. Okay, so that's the solution too, is um, to also get a better credit card. And credit cards are not the same thing as banks, but related to banks. So um, just some background information on credit cards. There's three main ways credit cards make money. So the first is obviously the annual fee. And so um, some cards don't have an annual fee. And if you have a, if you can get a credit card that doesn't have an annual fee, that's that's best. But some of these annual fees can be pretty expensive. Um, some of them include various perks, but banks make a good amount of money on the annual fees for credit cards. And then is the interest the interest rate and the interest fees. So if you don't pay off the credit card or can't pay off the credit card each month, 
then there's interest and it's really high. Um, I think some of them are even higher than what I have here, which is like 20 or 22 percent. Um, it's it's really it's really gouging people. Um, and most Americans have credit card debt. It's really a big problem in this country, over a trillion dollars of credit card debt in this country. And um, they pay a lot in interest and fees and the banks make a lot off of interest and interest and fees off of credit cards and carrying a balance month to month. But then even if you pay off your balance, even if you have no annual fee and you pay off your balance each month, there's still a transaction fee. And this is basically hidden to you as the user but anytime you go to a credit card, like, or go to a, make a purchase. So like, say you go to a restaurant and you spend a hundred dollars. Well, the restaurant doesn't get that full hundred dollars. They usually get around 97 of those dollars. And then they pay a fee of around 3%. Sometimes it's 3.5 or maybe a little less, but 3% is kind of the average. So then you take that 3% and of that, a lot of credit cards, give some sort of rebate back to the cardholder, like whether that's points or merchandise or cash back, um, one to 2% goes back to you, the cardholder, and that's to keep you coming back to that credit card. And then the rest goes to the bank that issued that credit card. So a lot of these credit cards come through the big fossil banks. And so those banks are making a lot of money. And so, you know, it's basically, I'm, I'm going to go in and, use this card and it's going to create a ripple effect. And depending on what kind of card you use and who is issuing that card, that ripple effect can be to support fossil fuels or it can be more to support communities. So that kind of gets to issuing and branding of cards. Um, so this is something most people don't even think about or realize. But a card can be branded in many different ways, like um, a store card, and, and we'll get to that in a minute, or, you know, a diff different types of cards. And that's usually right there on the front, how the card is branded. Um, and sometimes the brander and the issuer are the same, but the issuer is the bank that, like, all that money is going through. And that's usually on the back of the card, sometimes in small print. Um, but that's the, that's the entity that gets these user fees. So if you have a community bank or credit union that has its own credit card, or if you can find one and they have a card, and you know your bank or credit union is not involved with fossil fuels, then their card is not going to be involved in fossil fuels. But a lot of the, especially the smaller banks and credit unions do not have cards. And so then you are stuck looking for a card. <laughs> so... Um, these um, logos at the bottom are issuers of various cards um, that these would be considered fossil free. So like TCM Bank is, all they do is issue credit cards and they are out of the ICBA, which is something, cons the consortium of small bankers, and they do not invest in fossil fuels. And so it's like a, a consortium of, a, of like hundreds of smaller banks. And then they have TCM that all it does is issue credit cards. Um, FNBO is First National Bank of Omaha, which is um, like started as a community agricultural bank there. They do not do fossil fuels, but they do, they, they have a lot of business in credit cards. And so they're, they are a decent issuer. Beneficial State Bank, which is in, um, based in California, is a really great bank, very climate conscious, founded by Tom Steyer and his and his wife, and they do a lot of community investing and a lot of work on climate. And then CUNA is um, the credit union, like they guarantee credit union, um, you know, deposits up to $250,000. They're not in fossil fuels. And um, I'm gonna have to look up what P PSCU means again. Um, but yeah, that's, um, oh, that's payment systems for credit unions. That's another large credit union um, card issuer. So these are some, just a few responsible card choices. We have more on our website um, at Green America. Um, Evergreen is a card that offers 2% cash back um, through First National Bank of Omaha. It's fossil free. Beneficial has a climate card. Amalgamated Bank is a really great bank out of New York that's like rooted in labor. 
um, and labor unions, um, they have a card. And then Green America has an affinity card that goes through TCM. We're actually looking to move that to beneficial. So just a few more tidbits about credit cards. Um, so affinity cards are like that Green America card. You know, a lot of nonprofits, Sierra Club has one. A lot of nonprofits have a credit card. So part of that 3% goes to support the nonprofit. It's a way to make easy passive donations to a nonprofit. It's usually, I think 0.5% usually goes back to the nonprofit. And then the rest is kind of split between you, the customer of the card, and then the bank that it's running through. But you have to check because even um, some groups, some groups that you would not expect, some big environmental groups, um, issue their cards through a mega bank. That, so those transaction fees end up funding fossil fuels. And then there's store cards um, like Lowe's, Verizon. You know, a lot of people have store cards. You go to JCPenney, you shop for clothes. They ask you, do you want to open up a store card and you get 20% off and people do. Um, so most of those come through uh, organizations called either Synchrony or Community. Either of those are fine. They're not heavily invested or I don't think they're invested at all in fossil fuels, but some of them go through big banks. So like the Costco store card goes through Citibank and there's currently a nationwide campaign to try to get Costco to leave city and go to either synchrony or community. Um, Amazon's card goes through Chase. So even if you pay off your full amount every month, you're still sending transaction money through to Chase. Um, and then just about Visa and MasterCard, those are not the credit card issuers or branders. They are more like a processing system. So they move money back and forth. Um, so they're not, they don't have like billions and billions of dollars sitting around to invest in fossil fuels. They don't really do that. Um, they're more about just moving the money. And then American Express is, is the same and is fossil free. They have high annual and transaction fees. Um, you know, some stores won't take them because it's not 3%, it's more like, I think, 8 or 10%. Um, and, and they also have high annual fees too. But people do have American Express. So um, yeah, Fran Teplitz is my predecessor in this position and was at Green America for 23, 24 years. Um, and so, you know, she sort of, she started a lot of this work that I have inherited. And she talks about when you use a mega bank's card, you're bolstering all the things that their loans support, you know, whether it's clear cutting forest or building coal plants or, you know, predatory loans. Like some of these banks were, you know, fined heavy fines by the government for predatory loans during the housing crisis and, and afterwards. Um, but community banks and community credit unions, um, you can avoid these bad practice and also positively impact your community. So divesting from these fossil banks is part of the larger divestment movement. Um, and so there's a, a thing called the divestment database, which Stand Earth maintains. And so this is all institutional investors. We're talking about individual investors, um, which can actually add up. <laughs> and we're actually gonna be starting a program about that. I'll get to that in a minute. But for institutional investors, um, They've divested, almost 1,600 institutions so far have divested over 40 trillion from fossil fuels. And you can see from the chart that faith-based organizations, educational and philanthropic, you know, are kind of the lead on that, but there's a lot of different kinds of institutions. Um, so I have here, and, and I can share this PowerPoint, all of these are active links if you, you know, once you get the PowerPoint. Um, but these are links to a lot of different resources, like that's the third act carbon calculator, that's our responsible credit cards page and our bank map. Um, and then I also threw in, although we're not talking about that today, insurance is kind of a an, an very much an emerging frontier in climate finance. Um, and then some uh, some resources for investing. So yeah, that's what I've got for a presentation. 
And I can stop share. I may end up sharing again if we start. I was about to say, I'm going to have some questions for you. So you might end up sharing again. But thank <laughs> you. That was super informative. I I was sitting here like taking notes. Um, so we really appreciate you going through that. Um, but I so I have a few questions where I think I'll maybe just start us off with some of the ones that I came up with listening to your presentation today. Um, so if you, there are all the steps that you mentioned um, in solution one, get a better bank. And I think you shared two resources that um, the Green America Bank Map and Mighty Deposits. Um, mm -hmm. If you, do you think we can explore those? I know you mentioned that, but I feel like that would be really helpful because, you know, one of the biggest questions that I have when I think about this topic is how do I find a bank that that fits in with my values. Um, where do I go? Where do I even start? Do I Google it? <laughs> or maybe I use one of these resources? Yeah, there are several good um, bank directory resources. So I'll um, I'll share my screen and we can look at both the, the main two that I had talked about today. So, all right. So uh, for the Green America website, if you go to finance, and then under finance is, we'll just go under there. There's a few um, landing pages under that. You go to better banking. And this explains a lot of what I just said about why to switch to a different bank. So we can skip that for now, but we want to actually get a better bank. And so this one has banks and credit cards. So this is gonna launch this bank map. And okay, I'm just gonna be full disclosure. It's not that pretty. <laughs> we're, we're going to be, I um, actually just got email from our tech people that we're going to be um, moving this or, or we're going to be updating this into something more user friendly. But um, I think I actually, let me go back and show you the, this has the criteria again for how to get on our map. So kind of our map is these, like any bank on here is good. The Mighty Deposits map, they show you here's the community investment of all banks and so they show you the good and the bad um, but since a lot of people come to our bank map and they aren't in a course like you know a presentation like this we want to make sure that any bank on here is would be a good bank for what we're trying to do so you can either just use this map to zero in on where you want to go or just a handy thing if you click that and you go to sacramento say and it pulls up this location, it'll zero in on that. And so, um, you know, one reason I want to expand the criteria for our map is there's not a lot that meet those resources and there are some other good banks. So I'll show you those in my detail. It looks like there's one right in Davis potentially. Um, yeah, there's one in Davis, Travis Credit Union. Okay, cool. So you can well, go to that. And go to us then. Yeah, and then in Sacramento, they have, um, this kind of, oh yeah, they have an East West Bank branch and a Beneficial State Bank branch. And Beneficial has ATMs all over. So I, I checked with them and they do have a ton of ATMs in Davis, but the bank branch Sacramento would be the closest. Mm, um, what's the one that's right above Davis up in Woodland? That one's also that's Travis. also Travis, okay. <laughs> yeah, we put the, um, we really tried to get all the branches of any bank that we were listing in there so people could find it. Um, so is that a challenge that people face with um, sometimes using a credit union or some of these other banks is that there might not be as many branches and how do folks kind of overcome that issue? Yeah, that can be a challenge. More and more banking is done online. So mm -hmm. you don't often, like sometimes you don't really often have to go to a branch. Um, and so if you don't have one like, five minutes from your house, you know, maybe that's not so bad. You might not want one to be like 45 minutes away, but you, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily have, some people they've just done all online banking. So the Clean Energy Credit Union, which funds a lot of renewable energy projects, they're, they're out of Colorado, but they're all online. Anyone in the country can do that. Or, you know, any of the, any of these good banks like Beneficial, even though the branch is in Sacramento, if you're mostly online, you're fine. And that's and a good do most of them have relationships with other 
ATMs or other banks where I could withdraw money at a different location that maybe isn't a beneficial bank or, or Travis location? Yeah. Yeah. I know beneficial does. I think most of the ATMs are like all highly networked. So mm -hmm. I checked ATMs for beneficial state bank in Davis. And it, I mean, it just like covered the city. So you would probably be able to find an ATM basically anywhere. <laughs> Okay, so that's okay. actually probably not as much of a, a challenge then um, in using some of these. Um, and I guess, um, you know, you mentioned CDFIs, um, MDIs. I was wondering if maybe you could give a little bit um, more detail about what those are. Um, like, what's a community development financial institution? I know they invest in the community, but how are they, how are they different than a big bank? It, it seems like they're also different than a credit union. Yeah, so they, I mean, that's their mission is to invest in communities and especially low income areas and minority areas. Um, so like we have a CDFI um, where I live in Ohio and they've invested in lots and lots of small businesses for, you know, African Americans, Black Americans or, you know, different different um, minority groups and women. Um, they invest in a lot of businesses that, um, you know, a lot of Black women owned businesses and where a regular bank might not give them a loan, a CDFI will, um, mm -hmm. because that's their mission. And a minority de um, depository institution, that's an ed like a federal government defined thing. Um, and so okay. we just took that data um, but that just means a bank that is either owned by um, a, like Black Americans or African Americans, um, or my, I think minority groups of any sort, or they primarily serve those communities or both. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So there's certain requirements they have to meet to get that FDIC stamp. Yeah, I think I also read that because they like, community development financial financial institutions serve people of color, low income um, communities, they and those communities tend to be unbanked and not have access to banking services. These mm -hmm. banks might also have lower balances allowed, um, or they have they cover kind of fees for overdrafts a little is that true? Yeah, well I do know for um there's a so for there's a community development credit union called Self Help that um, one of their people is on our board so I got to know her and they have like special mortgage programs so they told me that you know there are three like primary obstacles to getting a housing mortgage one is the down payment you know getting together the money for the down payment one mm -hmm. is if you have student loan payments. And um, gosh, what was the third? I, the third will come to me. <laughs> um, but they, so they created a program that addressed all of these. And so the program allowed people to that down payment, which is normally about 5%, was rolled into the mortgage. So they didn't yeah. have to come up with all of that money for a down payment. And then for student loans, um, as long as you were in like an income-based repayment program, um, which for a lot of people, especially if you're low income, um, brings your payment to zero. Um, a, a regular conventional bank, they're going to look at the balance of the loan. They're going to look at like what your payment would be if you weren't on income repayment. But self-help will say, well, you're on income repayment, so we're not going to consider that. And so, um, so they, so that's the way that program worked. And so people are able to get mortgages and buy homes that wouldn't be able to otherwise. And that's really a key to financial, you know, generational wealth is home ownership. So. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Of, I wonder if the other is maybe if you have like health related um, uh, kind of loans or something, but um, uh, you mentioned mortgages and when we're thinking about sort of banking, you know, like in addition to a checking or savings account, mortgages or loans are probably a big thing that people use their, um, you know, their bank for. Uh, do you have anything else you'd want to add on that beyond what you've already said? Um, just that a community development bank will be easier to deal with <laughs> for those things mm -hmm. than, 
you know, a big, big bank um, will, because that's what they do is, mm -hmm. that's their job is to invest in the community. So a community development bank or credit union. Okay. Um, another question I had was related to step 10 um, that you, you had there, which was encouraging um, a workplace or congregation, alma mater, nonprofit, um, to use a community development bank. And I'm curious if there's any information out there about how you have that conversation um, because they're, they're, they might be different. They might have much more money um, that they need to invest in. Uh, maybe they feel more comfortable using a big bank, I, but how, how do we have that conversation with those organizations that we're associated with? Yeah, I would start with values because the whole reason we're talking about moving our money is values. Because if, especially if they're in one of those mega banks, if it's a house of worship and if they have any sort of like creation care or sustainability program, um, well, what the big, you know, what the Wall Street banks are doing is not in line with the hat. So mm -hmm. if they, you know, and they can certainly do all of their own research on this, you know, even if they get out of like a Chase or a Wells Fargo and get into like a key bank or some other regional bank, that's still like, you know, you're, they're still lowering carbon emissions a lot. Um, and every community is going to be different. So you have to really research the banks in your community, which is one of the reasons we're started talking about starting a curriculum and having cohorts is so people can work together to do that research and find, you know, different banks in, in your community. And, you know, there may be several good banks in a community, but you pick one because it's close to your house or somebody else picks one because, they have a small business and this bank is easier to work with for the, that reason. Um, so you just have to do research and, and an institution would probably want to do, you know, at, you know, if they were, you know, at least may, like maybe get them to have a few people to start looking into it. They might not want to commit to it right away. Um, mm -hmm. But once you start seeing, well, here are the options and there are options. In fact, I don't have to stay at this mega bank because there are good options in our community. You know, just the idea of, you know, buy local, eat local, shop local, bank local. I mean, it just kind of makes sense. And a lot of people really support that. So, you know, I guess I would start with common values. And mm -hmm. Okay. Um and then, you know, you you had all those, those not wonderful, I suppose they're quite horrifying, but like, you know, all those statistics at the beginning related to the banks and their investment in fossil fuels. And um, how, how do I, how do I find information like that? Um, where do I look? Do I Google it and just, you know, type in fossil fuel investment in my bank name? Like, um, you know, one of my first banks that I had was PNC. I didn't see it on the list there, but I, I don't know. They're a big, they're, they are also like a big bank. And so how would I find out um, where? Yeah, well, there's, I mean, the first place I start is banking on climate chaos. So I switched this shared screen. Hopefully you all can see it to yeah, we can still the see most, it. this is the 2023 report. Um, and you can download that whole report if you want to. These are global banks, but let me see if I can get down to the, top yeah these are the so they've gone through like all of the you know i guess the corporate reports and the government reports to find the the top funders of fossil fuels and these are the top 60 or well this is the top 12 but their report has the top 60 i don't remember if pnc is in there or not pnc is definitely you know they're not into fossil fuels like Chase is, but they are into them. They do, they do fund them. Um, so that would be one place to start. Another place, um, and I can show. I guess I can show Mighty Deposits. Um, so they talk about community investment. They have separate searches for banks and credit unions. So we'll just go into banks, and you can either search by your location, or you can look up by a bank name. So. We'll just look up PNC, which started in Pittsburgh. Yeah, so I went to college in Pittsburgh, so that's why I got a bank account with PNC. There you go, yeah. <laughs> um, 
So mighty deposits will tell you like out of the hundred, how much of this money is, do they invest in their community? Um, and it'll tell you how much in their state or city. And then they'll tell you, you know, these are what we call the good guy buttons. They don't have major funder of fossil fuels, but we do know they do some fossil fuel funding. I mean, you know, Pennsylvania is a fracking state as is Ohio and, you know, mm -hmm. was started in coal. Um, Pittsburgh was very heavy into coal at the time, but this will tell you what they are invested in. So they do a lot of large business, housing, households is like mortgages and car loans, um, public works, and then small business, they're less than average, farms, they're less than average. Um, and I guess we, our kind of guideline for community investing is try to find a bank that's 60% or more. Um, mm -hmm. So 37% is a little bit low. Okay, so 60% is a good benchmark to use. Yeah, 60 or above is a good benchmark. For that. And when I see large business in terms of community investment, because that's community investment, that's not necessarily like large publicly traded companies. That's just local businesses that are larger. Yeah, but a lot of them could be publicly traded. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So like uh, one of the people I'm working with on all this, she lives in Charlotte and um, Bank of America is headquartered in Charlotte. And so for people there, that's their local bank. And mm, uh, okay, it's a heavy fossil bank, but that's a lot of people have jobs there and bank there. Okay, so like a company like Pittsburgh Plate Glass, which is a huge corporation, but is located in Pittsburgh or Pennsylvania, might fit under that large business in terms yeah. of community investment. Yeah, something, yeah, something like that. It could. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's that's really helpful. This is fascinating. Um, so this <laughs> is Mighty. Is that what you said it was? The website. Mighty deposits. Um, yeah, my, yeah. This one's mighty deposits. So that's a good okay. one to check. So they'll have they have the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so if you know what you're doing and you have a benchmark, and you know, but what we don't want to have happen is somebody searches you know, with all the banks in my community, and then they find oh, there's a Chase Bank like two blocks from my house. I'll go there. No, <laughs> we don't want you ending up there. Mm -hmm. You know, so. that uh, makes sense. Um, so just to switch gears a little bit, um, you were talking about credit cards and I think, you know, I, I remember my dad has a Southwest credit card and, but I think Chase is the issuer of that card. And like, how do you know what is the issuing entity of a card that you have? Because when I, when I've seen his card, it just, you know, it's a Southwest airlines on it. Yeah, yeah, that's the branding. And that's um, a, basically kind of a store card for Southwest Airlines. And mm -hmm. you have to turn it over on the back. And it's usually a little tiny print towards the bottom. But if Chase is the issue, or there'll be a Chase logo down there. Okay. Um, yeah. And so, you know, if you do cancel that card, if he does cancel that card, he'll get to keep the airline miles he has. Um, but he wouldn't get any more because he wouldn't be using that card anymore. Okay, well, that's helpful to know because maybe people have some points like racked up or miles racked up, um, yeah. but um, that they'd want to use for something. Um, so, and then another piece that you mentioned was related to home and auto insurance. And that was not an area that I had really thought about. I know you just touched on it briefly, but um, are there are there a lot of resources around that as well? Yeah, so insurance is sort of an emerging front. And uh, well, I'm sure in California, you all know that um, State Farm and I think maybe farmers or uh, there's been a couple of insurance companies that are canceled, like no longer insuring people in climate vulnerable states. So in California and Florida and Louisiana, there's a, like large insurance companies have just said, we're not going to insure you anymore. And yet at the same time, so this is another thing I've learned. Insurance companies, are, you know, I always thought they collect your premium. And then, you know, if Joe down the street has a fire at his house, some of my money that I paid in premium helps him rebuild. Or if I have a fire, some of his money helps me rebuild. And that's true. But that's not the end of the story. Insurance companies also take all that premium money and invest it. And the big ones again, invest in fossil fuels. So like State Farm is 
heavily invested in fossil fuels. So they're not insuring people, and yet they're they're still funding and insuring. So you know they also have to insure these oil and gas projects. An oil and gas project could not happen if they didn't have insurance. And they're also investing in oil and gas. So you know, on the one hand, they're helping fund the things that make the climate crisis worse, and then they're leaving homeowners holding the bag. So mm -hmm. they're becoming. So there's a campaign called Insure Our Future. Let me go to their website. And they actually have a scorecard. Their scorecard is again um, global agencies. If this comes up, I'll show this to you. Um, and it's like the 30 or 40 biggest ones. Um, but here's their scorecard. And you can see a lot of insurance companies towards the top and their scores aren't even really very high. Um, but international insurance companies rank higher, the US companies as you go down. Um, so like here's the bottom ones. Star, I had not heard of before. I think they are mainly like they insure large corporations. Um, they get zeros across the board for one of these um, columns. So these columns are, they split it between coal and oil and gas. And this is underwriting, meaning they provide insurance policies versus, and then investments actually investing in. And these are the scores for investing and underwriting coal on one column and oil and gas. And so um, I think STAR actually both underwrites and invests in a lot of fossil fuels. Um, Berkshire Hathaway, like they're all like gobbling each other up. Berkshire Hathaway owns GEICO. So if you have GEICO auto insurance, which I had for a while, well, Berkshire Hathaway has zero policies about not investing in coal. Like most of them are, a lot of them are like pulling investments from coal. They are not pulling investments yet from oil and gas. So there are starting to be campaigns about that. Liberty Mutual um, is pretty heavy into oil. They have a, so a mutual insurance company is sort of like a credit union in that if you're a customer there, uh, I think you, I'm still learning about this, but you get to vote or you have a voice in some of the policies. But with Liberty Mutual, a lot of the customers are oil and gas. And so they're the ones setting a lot of these policies. So they get very low rankings on underwriting and investing. And like with oil and gas, they're at a zero. With coal, they at least get like a couple of points. So you can look up this um, to see, but a lot of the US insurance companies do not fare very well. And even the best international ones like Allianz, uh, Allianz, I think that's how they say it. Mm -hmm. Allianz. Allianz still is like not, you know, what we would want it to be. So. So actually Green America is working with, um, the group we're working with on this curriculum called Green Faith is the name of the group I'm working with on this. We're gonna be putting together, so like with the banks, you know, there's several directories, you know, they're all a little bit different and they might have slightly different listings, but they they exist. With insurance, there is no directory about where to go for like fossil free or at least community better insurance. And kind of the general rule of thumb is go local, go regional, go in your state, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, my husband and I just did. We switched from, we had Liberty Mutual and I'm a climate activist and I didn't know that like, they're all about fossil fuels. So we switched to a local insurance called Grange and we saved $900. So, you know, a lot of times it's cheaper to go local and the policy, everything is the same in terms of the amounts it covers and things like that. So um, we're gonna be working on an insurance type directory to help fill that gap. Wow, oh, thank you. Thanks for sharing <laughs> that. that that's, that's amazing work. Um, so I am going to start turning it over to some of the questions that we have coming in. So if anybody has any questions, we have a few already that I see, um, you know, please feel free to add more or even just share like what you were hoping to learn today, why you're here, what part of the process you're in, in terms of potentially, are you thinking about making this change? Was that, was this just a nice thing to do this evening? Um, <laughs> but, and now you're considering it just, you know, whatever, whatever you're you're thinking about um please let us know but 
I think some of the questions here are related to the practicalities of, of making a change like this. And so um, the first question that I see here is why save three years of statement records prior to closing a mega bank account? I think, um, and I will go get a better answer for this, but it's a general rule of thumb, you know, in case there's some kind of, um, you know, I guess dispute <laughs> about any of the transactions there or anything you find, or if God forbid you get audited, um, it's, you know, just to have that for records uh, in case, you know, it's probably not gonna be necessary, but you, it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. So. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll and, answers of that. and then for the other questions, I will, um, I'll turn it over to Brittany, actually, who will, who will manage this, um, if she is online. Hello, I'm here. Okay, great. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you. By the way, awesome presentations. I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, I'm glad you liked it. Please do send it, though. Please send it. I'm, That's like, texting my dad. I've been texting my dad. I'm like, hey, when I'm here for Thanksgiving, I think we should talk about bank accounts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go break out mighty deposits at the Thanksgiving table. You'll be real popular. Oh, not at the Thanksgiving table, but no, yeah. <laughs> I'm a comms major. I'll, we'll figure it out. Um, yeah. There'll be a good way to do that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But um, we have a question from Bernadette here on, are there resources available to help credit union or local bank users approach their banking entity? to encourage um, improvement in their investing practices. So when you talk about like telling the mega bank why you broke up with them, like are there resources for that anywhere? Oh gosh, well, if it's a mega bank and they're in banking on climate chaos, I would just take that and tell them, you know, this does not align with my values. And, you know, the, sometimes a question comes up, well, is it better for me to talk to them or just leave? And in the case of these mega banks at this point, like there have been campaigns towards them, I mean, for like years and years, like probably two decades <laughs> that somebody's been campaigning or trying to talk to them about this and they just don't do it. Um, and we're at a real inflection point with climate. Like, uh, you know, if you're following this, you know, the graphs for like ocean temperatures or, um, global warming, like they're having to reinvent the y-axis because the warming is so much. And it's it's really, really scary. And these banks should not be doing this. And at some point you just have to walk away. And so it's sort of like with, um, you know, with apartheid in South Africa and the divestment movement there, um, there was research afterwards, you know, asking the question, well, did this divestment actually hurt these companies that did business in South Africa, like economically. And the, the answer was not that much economically, but what it did do is it sullied the brand. It associated them with this terrible practice of apartheid. And that's what forced them to change. And so that's what we're trying to do with the big Wall Street banks here is they are enabling and you know their flow of money is why the climate, you know, if that wasn't happening, we wouldn't be having a climate crisis and they have to stop. And, um, and so that's what this is about. And so if you move your money, you know, it's a tiny amount of money, especially for an individual investor, but you have an outsized voice because of their brand. And if you let them know, this is why I'm moving my money and I'm telling all my friends about this and I'm telling like my school and the nonprofit I'm on a board of and my church about this, well, that carries some weight. It carries more weight than the money itself. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and when you say tell them, are you like who are you telling? Um, sorry, I'm I don't I don't yeah. do that in my house, yeah. but um <laughs> like who am I who am I reaching out to when I do that? Probably the bank manager, like the branch manager in your branch, because they will send that information upstairs. Okay. Um, like we had a protest at a Chase Bank in downtown Columbus. And after it was over, we took a letter in that everybody had signed and they knew we were out there and they took that letter and they said, they said, we're going to send this up the chain. So yeah, I, I would say that. And, and then I 
see a question in terms of credit unions. So credit unions aren't really culprits in funding fossil fuels, but you might ask them for, you know, do you have a breakdown of, you know, the categories of your investments and, you know, if you want, if you think they should be investing more in, say, housing, if you have a housing shortage in your area, or affordable housing, or small business, things like that, you know, just maybe talk to them about that. But that might not be a reason to leave. Um, but if you have, especially a credit union, because if you're the customer of the credit union, like, you have a voting voice in some things. So they should want to hear what your preferences are on that. Um, let's see. I think Leslie actually had a question on here. Um, she asked me, has Green America identified insurance companies that are fossil free? Um, and like, could we go to Grange as Californians? Well, I, Grange is in, I think they're, they're regional in Ohio. That identified them. So Maybe check back in six months. Um, oh, I think my internet wonking out. We are hoping to have this in January. But in general, like if it's a regional or hmm. or a local insurance, go to like an independent insurance agent and say. You know, you want an insurance company that doesn't deal in your community and they should know. They should be able to help you with that. You broke up a little bit, Kathy, but um, I think, uh, I don't know if maybe turning off the camera sometimes like saves a little bandwidth, but, um, yeah, but it's my we got, maybe if you could just repeat some of those key points. I definitely, I missed it. Yeah, missed no, you. absolutely. Yeah, I think we were talking about, um, we weren't talking about, oh, we were talking about insurance. Do, do, do we have, um, so Green America does not yet have a directory of insurance. We hope to have that like sometime this spring or this summer. Um, and so check back on that. But in general, um, if they are local to your area or regional to your area, um, they probably don't invest in fossil fuels. Um, you have to be of a certain size because fossil fuel projects are generally pretty big. Um, but if you have, you know, if you call up a local insurance agent in your community and you tell them, I want an insurance company in my community that doesn't invest in fossil fuels, they should be able to help you find, find that. Um, the insurance company that, that my husband and I went to in Ohio, they're regional here, so I don't know if they do anything in California. Thank you. I saw also there were some comments, but go ahead, um, Brittany, feel free to jump in. Yeah, um, I think, um, yeah, there are just two more comments, not questions so far. Um, there's um, from Bernadette saying that she likes her Amtrak credit card for miles, which is issued by FNBO. I don't know if that's a, is that a good one? Yeah, that's First National Bank of Omaha and Sorry. they're fossil free. Wonderful. And then she also said, and this is good to know, um, that she recently learned that insurance companies are allowed to cancel a new policy for 60 days after issuing a new policy. So you'll need to keep your old policy for um two months just in case that is um, good to know <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah definitely yeah. i'm curious is there anybody in the um who's listening tonight who has broken up with their mega bank um i'd be i'd be interested to know what that process looked like um on the other end but um feel free to you know raise your hand or put in a comment if you did because I haven't, but I'm thinking about it now <laughs> after <laughs> knowing all these resources that exist out there. Well, okay, I, I'll i pop up. Um, so I had um, a credit card through TCM for League of Women Voters and I still have it. And I got it thinking it was fossil fuel free. 
And I think it actually is, but this is a sort of a different question. I called TCM and asked the customer service agent, can you tell me whether, you know, your bank is fossil fuel free? And the agent had no information, which is, which I went on as the answer, as assumedly no, because this agent said, you know, I have no specifics for you on that and I and didn't actually know the answer. So that worries me because you're saying TCM is a good bank to go with. And so it worries me that customer service agents don't always get the story, the information to share with customers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I kept it, but I also opened a beneficial bank card. So now I have options. So I guess that's sort of a question about, you know, um, don't, you know, the, the folks that work for the banks don't necessarily know the mission, which is unfortunate reality, um, potentially. Yeah. So some of the, well, there's some various third act groups that have been doing some of this research. And one thing they do is they call the banks they're researching, they call them and see if they can talk to somebody who's knowledgeable and, you know, will answer their questions. And first of all, see if they can reach a human being. So some banks you can. And so if they can't reach a human being, that bank is not on their list. Um, in this case, you did reach a person. I, I would, if somebody doesn't know the answer, I think I would ask to speak to their manager. But also I do wanna disclose some information about TCM which is um, part of They are a subsidiary of independent community bankers of banks. They are fossil free because they aren't even big enough to invest in fossil fuels. But they have a statement on their website saying we, oh crud, I hope I'm, I hope I'm coming. I can hear you, oh, maybe now I can. Yeah, they have a statement on their website saying we do not believe in telling our banks not or telling anybody not to invest in fossil fuels. We are not going to sign on to that or dictate that. And that might be why the customer service agent didn't either said they didn't know or maybe didn't know. Maybe they're not being told because TCM is this strange beast that they're not investing in fossil fuels, but yet they say, well, we have the right to if we wanted to. And they're real adamant about this. And so full disclosure, this is like one of the main reasons why Green America is looking to move to Beneficial because Beneficial is definitely fossil free. They are proudly fossil free. They will tell you that and they will tell you what they do invest in and they're a fantastic bank. So yeah, I hope that move is able to be done in the next few months. Yeah, that's great to hear. And you know, Beneficials has a, a tool also as I, as that I, in my process of getting the Beneficial card, that has is similar to the mighty deposits in that it shows um, the good, right? The the commitments that the that yes, uh, they do have that. are made. Yeah, I think there was a Carolyn had a question that um, still hasn't been addressed. No, I think that was related. That was, that was the first question. I think um, are you talking about the the why save three years one, Leslie? Yes. Yeah, that one was the first question that we asked. Um, and that was mainly just because um, in case you get audited or in case you need it, it's just good to have them there. Um, I did have actually a question though for the first couple steps. And again, mm -hmm. full disclosure here. Yeah, like I, I'm currently not controlling all my finances. Um, so question for people who are like a little bit scared about this stuff um how do you actually move when you say you're moving your deposits and you're moving um the, like what does that actually mean for those first few steps yeah usually that's electronic um so if you open up you know like you know say you find a, this great community bank in your town and you go open up an account there well you will have that account's routing numbers and um, and the account numbers. And so you can, usually you can just electronically move money from one bank account from a, that's a totally different bank to another bank. Like it's, you know, pay a person and you're basically paying yourself. 
So let's say you have $5,000 in your mega bank and you've opened up uh, an account at Beneficial. Well, you might want to move, you know, depending on what withdrawals you think are coming through, um, maybe move 3,000 of that and, and get your deposits and then get your deposits moved. So you have to have the routing numbers and the account numbers for, for mainly for your new bank um, to start moving the automatic deposits over first and then move your automatic withdrawals over. So it's a, it's a little bit of a process and it, you know, it takes it, it takes some time and some stubbornness <laughs> to do it. So that's one reason why we do. So I'm working with Green Faith and we are actually building a curriculum to cover banks, credit cards, insurance, and investments. And we are hoping to um, recruit cohorts. So like say we have a dozen people that are all members of a certain congregation or like in a certain community or they're in a certain um, organization and they wanna work on this together. So at first it's just looking at here's the problem and here's you know, a lot of the resources that we talked about today, you know, go do some research. And so a group might split up, you know, here's, we're gonna make this list of banks and we're gonna, and, and credit unions, and we're gonna call them, we're gonna figure out what their services are. We're gonna make sure we can reach a person there. And then they narrow, they can narrow it down. So as a group, if you're splitting up that research, then it's a lot easier if you're trying to do that all yourself. Um, and so then that can help people, you know, and they also just kind of work together. So then if one person says, well, I ran into this issue and moving this, you know, this deposit or this withdrawal and, you know, they can brainstorm and kind of help each other through that. But in the meantime, um, also there's a organization called This Is What We Did. They're affiliated with Third Act and with Green Faith. They have this thing called office hours and they have people that you can actually call. So if you are moving your money yourself and you don't know what to do, like they will talk you through and give you support in doing that. But you know, it, it is involved. And so we wanna create a structure that will help people actually go through with this. Like we know we need to do it. When are you gonna actually do it and actually going through with it? And then we wanna track the money that people are moving. And you know, if you've got 12 people and they're moving bank accounts, that can add up. And so that the one tracker I showed you is all institutional, but you know, we want to get individuals in there too. Fabulous. So I would like to offer now um, anyone who wants to join us and, and be promoted to panelists and wants to um, uh, ask a question directly, uh, go ahead and raise your hand, use the... Um, uh, let's see, raise hand is under more for me um, if you want to ask a question directly. Um, and also, um, Reka, you could talk a little bit and, and Kathy as well about investments. Um, and um, we we have a little teaser for the, the uh, follow on event that we're hoping will happen in January. And I want to officially invite Kathy to that as well. Um, and that is more Reka's wheelhouse. And so, um, you know, she will definitely be um, more in um, delivery uh, official um, uh, expert mode then. Um, Rekha, do you want to give us a little teaser for what that might be about? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, Kathy touched on this and full disclaimer, you know, what I say doesn't reflect the views of my current past employers. Um, but, you know, People, you bank, but you also invest your money in whether that's your pension, maybe you're investing in mutual funds, or um, you have a 401k or a 403b, um, or all sorts of different accounts that folks have, or maybe you're thinking about it because I think investing has become a little more accessible to people over the last several years um, with, uh, and and so what we want to share is, you know, what does that look like? Kathy gave a wonderful, wonderful presentation on how you find the, like what resources are out there in terms of finding banks and what resources are out there in terms of evaluating investment advisors or um, uh, how do you put together, how do you look at this and research this into, in your portfolio? Um, and so, so we um, think that we can, you know, 
have a discussion about that. And because I think that's probably the other side of personal finance um, is not just banking, but also investing. And um, and so I'm hoping that we're going to have a really fantastic discussion around around that, um, I think, in, in January. Right, Leslie? Is that's that what we're looking at. Yeah, January. OK. But. Yeah, I, I, right now I work for a pension fund and I've worked for a state treasurer in the past and um, state treasurer's offices also manage um, your uh, like a college savings plan. And so there's all sorts of different investments that people might not think about that are um, quite commonplace um, that, that folks might be involved in. And there are ways to have influence and um, take action around those things because, yeah, there are investments in all sorts of different sectors and industries and um and and I think every every investor small and large has a voice um and you can also find out about how you can have a voice with a larger invest with your with just yourself or with a larger fund and so we're hoping to cover all those things Fabulous. Okay. Any last words, Reka, Kathy? Thank you, Brittany, so much for um, helping us out with the Q&A. You know, just thank you, Kathy, for this amazing presentation and Cecilia for also participating, Brittany for managing um, the Q&A and Leslie for putting this all together. Um, without you, we wouldn't, we wouldn't really be, we wouldn't have listened to this. And, and honestly, I learned so much. I have pages and pages of notes here. Um, <laughs> so appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Thank you. And thank you to Brandon for our tech support and our other um, SVCC um, uh, fellows, Wendy Zong, Tamara um, Ida, and um, Cameron um, Kiongo was here earlier. Um, before we um, uh, sign off, um, we are having another event on December 3rd, chat with the chief of the Yolo County Office of Emergency Services, which should be, uh, um, should be really um amazing as well. And as we just mentioned in January, we plan on having a follow on to this, um, focus more on investments. And as Reka mentioned, that doesn't necessarily mean mutual funds or stocks. There's lots of um, other areas, including pensions. Um, if you're not already on our list, please get on our lists. And um, to help us continue this work, we are always happy to accept donations. Um, and if you have any questions about this, please email Cool Solutions. We will be um, sending follow-up um, Kathy's presentation, which should have those live links, which is great. Um, and um, uh, hopefully everything you mentioned, Kathy, is in there, because I know you mentioned a few um, tidbits that um, uh, hopefully they're, they're all in your presentation. We also have a, um, as part of the Yellow Earth Day pledge, we created a um, greening finances support doc and we'll also send that out to people. Brittany, am I forgetting anything pledge related or? I don't think so. Okay. I, I don't think so. Um, okay. not, not on this topic. Uh, okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Kathy, so much for staying up until 1030 at night working <laughs> or, or maybe are you, you're still three hours, correct? Ahead. Yeah, it's 1030 yes. here. Got it. That's okay, I'm a little bit of a night owl, so it's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Yes. Thank you to everyone. And um, we hope you'll join us next time as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.